Hi there, welcome to the first episode of Digging Deep. I'm Colin Rayner, aka Bull Char. I'm here with Steve Reed. Uh, Steve Reed works up in Christchurch. Uh, he deals a lot with uh, troubled youth and uh, people who are having problems in their life. So, uh, yeah. How are you, Steve? You live? Can you tell us a bit about yourself, Steve, your background? Uh, you, know, you and I know that uh, we met in 1982, uh, but no one else really knows uh, what you've been doing. If you could just tell us who you are, what you do, what you're doing at the moment, helping the community, helping helping right. New Zealand. Don't be modest. Uh, certainly, certainly. Well, I'll start off in my, uh, in my native tongue. Uh, koutou katoa. Uh, ko so I just uh, briefly said my ancestral mountain is uh, Hikurangi from the east coast and our river is the Waiapu and my tribe is Ngati Poro. Uh, I live here in Christchurch and uh and greetings to you all that's pretty much what i said in in my native uh tongue of te reo maori uh i won't go back into that to just to help everyone understand um uh, i'm i'm married uh i have three young adult um children and, and one new zealand who is studying one in australia working uh he's married uh, i love my kids dearly love my wife dearly and um uh, very proud of them all. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's that, that's I guess my origin. Um, uh, my father is a New Zealand Maori on his birth certificate that said full blood. However, we knew he had a a European ancestor in there somewhere, and on my my mother's side, so he was from the East Coast. Uh, she European New Zealander, which we call a Pakeha over here, and she's from uh, Cromwell. In the, in the South Island, so uh, they met in Wellington, and uh, uh, four kids later, my brothers and sisters, my siblings, and, and myself, born. Here we are. That's that's sort of how it all, all happened for, for us and me coming into the onto the scene. Um, I guess uh, yeah, Colin's thrown a couple of questions my way, and I was thinking, you know, just talking a bit about who I am, where I've come from, and uh, yeah, we, we met, uh, gosh, we were only uh, 16, I think, when we first met, eh, Colin? And, uh, of course, in the army, you get given a nickname, and uh, Colin's yeah. nickname, he probably may have never let this out, but, but back then it was Rat. <laughs> it's a good, good thing he's uh, he's developed into a bull tar. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, that's he's right. He's out a bit more, so... Uh, wow, well, there's uh, a story tar, over the... Over the... The, the rat thing was just because uh, we joined up in January, and of course in Wairu in January's midsummer really hot, and and uh, my nose burnt badly and went really pink. And every time I laugh, here people say, "Oh, it looks like a rat there." So and that's how it stuck. So there's no real. Oh, I, mean, well, I didn't I do anything really that. bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, at the time I was listening to ACDC, and they used to call me Dirty Reed, done dirt cheap. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, it, it didn't stick as hard as uh, Rhett Rainer anyway. So, uh, you know, in, in recent times, it's been fantastic for me to catch up with Colin, Aka uh old army mates from a long time ago. And uh, and there's a few others that are, that are kicking around as well. And, and we're just enjoying catching up with each other. And, you know, we've gone away and lived our lives and, and done different things. Uh, but I really want to acknowledge uh colin our mate bull Taylor, for his um stepping out to want to discuss uh and bring the news or his worldview uh in in relation to i guess social issues they are i suppose they are um and where things are at in new zealand not just in new zealand but around the world today a um, couple of things i like about it is number one, you just can't trust mainstream media anymore. We know that they're they're healthy, crazy, left, liberal, and and full of lies as well. And they will spin 
story after story that was just so full of error. And uh, anyway, I think a lot of us know that about the mainstream media. And what I am enjoying is more and more people who care. Um, and that, that's what I believe it's born out of. People care. It's like, hold on a minute. The truth isn't being told here. So, you know, our, those who watch this channel, or we may bump into it into the future, our mutual friend Colin here, Baltar, he stepped out and he's, uh, he's, he's making a difference. Excuse me, I'm bit of a drink here. <clears throat> so he's, he's put a, uh, a couple of questions my way um, uh, about some of our deep social issues in New Zealand. Firstly, I want to say, before I get into that, I suppose I, I'm part of the, we're all part of the social fabric of our society, but a bit about my upbringing, um, you know, my father was good at hunting. He was a hunter-gatherer, and he could work. <coughs> but as far as being a dad in many other aspects, not really. He was very violent. Uh, and he was very nasty with his mouth. Ruled our house with an iron fist or with a uh, steel toe boot. Um, you know, as a kid growing up, getting a hiding day. When I mean a hiding, I mean a severe beating. Beat the crap out of you until such time as you, you know, you wet your pants, you pick you up, throw you against the wall, kick, kick the shit out of you. Yep. I mean, many a time I can. I've lost, you know, I would have lost count. Sometimes it was a day, sometimes it was twice a day, just getting a hiding for, for who knows what. And the smallest little thing would send him flying off the handle. You know, he had no patience. Um, he couldn't handle any pressure. He just wasn't ready to be a father or a parent. And my mother, you know, she was looking for a good time, met this Māori Elvis, you know, dad could play the guitar and sing and look suave and everything else. So they ended up bringing, having a family together. No real great plan, I suppose, uh, during the 60s there. And um, did their best. I think they were nine, together 19 years. Uh, and so, you know, I guess my, my siblings and I, we could say, so my oldest siblings are baby boomers. I'm the oldest Gen X, 1965. And then my younger sister, so she's, a, she's an exit. Um, I guess you could say the whole four of us, um, we could consider ourselves um, victims. And we were victims of a violent, abusive home, a very controlling father to the point that he threatened lives, certainly that of my mother and, and all of us at some stage. I think uh, there's a term called crazy maker. He was a really made crazy for your life and many other people around him. So. Um, however, um, at this stage of my life, I am not angry at him. I'm not bitter at him. Uh, we buried him four years ago. Um, said our farewells. Everything was calm. Everything was good. Um, because along, I suppose, in my twenties, we we I really began to deal with that stuff. So I, I was an angry young guy, and I did have a lot of scars, but. But I had learned to, I guess we, yeah, we were just tough. We just pressed in and, and looked for solutions to our personal pain. What was, what was the catalyst, uh, Steve? Guess, did you have, um, was there something that, or did you just, did it just come gradually that you sort of realised that wasn't the way that forward, you know? Was there something specific or? <laughs> I remember the move when I went and, I went and saw Once the Warriors. And um, my brother and I, we didn't see it together, but we, we talked on the phone not long after it, both seen it at similar times. We talked on the phone and we thought, isn't that a normal upbringing? <laughs> yeah. And then we realised there, there were a lot of New Zealanders that were dramatised. And then a lot of Māori families were going, hey, you didn't know that went on in my house. And so people were really surprised. Um, so, yeah, for me, a catalyst, I guess my personality type, I'm a go, 
you know, get up, go get her. And with that personality and lacking in wisdom and being emotionally scarred as I was, I, I then, as a young man, stepped out uh, in my own life and um, did, did some good stuff. But I felt that after a while I was um, like climbing a shingle screen, you know, taking two steps forward but sliding five steps back. And that's what, how I felt spiritually and emotionally. So then I began searching. And um, at that stage, my mother had become a Christian. That's the last thing I wanted to do. But I gave her half an hour once a week to talk to me about the things of God. And whenever she spoke to me, I didn't understand a single word she said. But this is what, there was one thing she had. And that was, uh, you know, everybody has crap in their life. And my mother had, had a fair amount of crap dealing with my father. But she had this silly little grin. And, you know, we all grin when the times are good or when we receive a compliment or a blessing or something like that. But at that time in her life, she could grin through the difficult times, a little smile that she had. And I wondered what that was. And uh, so I realized it was like the presence of God in her life. So the long and the short of it is, um, back in the late 80s, I, I became a Christian. And I have been from that day to this and been involved in a lot of different things in the church. And that's really, I'm still there. Uh, I'm very involved in our Māori community. Uh, that also led me into a path of dealing in youth work and dealing in social services and later on running men's groups um, and also having government contracts, uh, dealing with young people um, and running a charitable trust that, um, yeah, we work with kids at risk we run our we had our own school running our own school um and so over that that's been a long period of time uh intermittent i've done lots of outdoor education training i did lots of work in construction and all those sorts of things but really that's where i've focused i'm sort of still there today um i got out of the running a charitable trust two years ago uh, just over two years ago, you know, two and a half years ago, uh, mainly because of the political correct hoops that they want you to jump through now. And, um, yeah, so that's sort of been the journey of what I've done. Um, it's expanded my horizon no end. Uh, I believe in personal growth and development and all those sorts of things. So if I go back to when I, you know, when I was young and that, um, even before I was a Christian, I knew that I had some kind of pain, that some things were wrong. Well, that's what made me start searching. But I knew I wasn't to wear it as a badge. And, you know, I listen to a lot of Jordan Peterson today, as well as many other speakers. And um, he said something that really resonated with me. And he says, we're all victims of something. Mum did something when you were young. Dad did something, you know. And kids, we remember things as kids, or even as adults. Something's happened to us. But... Um, having the label of a victim is just not helpful. And I guess, uh, I mean, I've done this, but he says, you know, if something, go and get help. If something's spiritually not right, then go seek out your spiritual counsel, get your prayer, get, get whatever you need. Uh, emotionally, go and see a counselor. If, so, if there's an injustice, if it's a legal issue, go and pursue the justice you need. Um, primarily to get yourself fixed. And I think, uh, and this is where I come back, because I like to deal with the issues of the heart, so you can get yourself centered. So I had to find a new center for me, because as a young man, when you, you be calling, I suppose, you know, all young brothers are young and selfish, and you just want to, everything's about you, save my money so I can go and do this. And then, uh, you know, I want, I want to get with that chick, and I want to have a few beers with the boys, all, all for me, you know, I never really thought about anyone else. Uh, so you need to establish a new center, whatever your center is. Um, so for me, my center is my faith. And then my centered place where I feel good about myself, um, it's just building all those small things in your life, you know, uh, those everyday, seemingly boring, mundane things that can be really good for you, you know, sitting in your chair, looking at your, your library there, grabbing a book, flicking through, or 
the way you keep your house, uh, you know, seeing your family smiling and then smiling back them without even saying anything, giving each other a hug, just enjoying life. Yeah, the simple things and, of life, uh, eh? You need to be centered in your... Yeah, that's, that's always the small things in life, I believe. Yeah, well, there's a great so, saying, uh, and I don't know who's... The great saying, I can't remember who said it, but uh, the best things in life aren't things, you know, and that's true, isn't it? Exactly. You know? And uh, I, I have found great satisfaction in life with this little saying, and I think it's been around for, you know, centuries, do the small things well and the big things will take care of themselves. And and that's generally, generally how I live, just one step at a time. Whatever, whatever's in front of me right now, just do it to the best of your ability. Um, there's a couple of other little sayings I sort of live by. Um, um, go where you're celebrated, not tolerated. That's, that's, that's an interesting one. Sometimes you do have to stick it out. But uh, generally, um, there's a group of people that, that want you, want want your company, want your ideas, want your want your presence. Well, we'll go there then, and and enjoy that community and be amongst them. Yeah. So anyway, that's a little bit about my background and some of my worldview and and stuff like that. Um, I could get into some of your some of your questions now. Yeah. Well, let's let's start at the top there. We were talking. Well, what's happened in America uh, after this? tragic event with poor old George Floyd, you know, I mean, it was shocking to see. I know, you know, anybody seeing that couldn't help but be absolutely shocked and disgusted. And, of course, it lit a fire over there that's sort of been moving around the world. But I'm not sure whether, you know, looting and burning down where you live is, is uh, doing much justice for poor old George Floyd and, and uh, in fact it's probably doing the opposite and, and people who aren't involved in the protest just looking nah. and saying well it's not is it really about that or is it really about tearing down the system or or just just thugs and vandals destroying stuff you know yeah. um, you know and so how and of course it's made it to New Zealand and uh, the big you know they think talking point at the moment of course is you know racism in New Zealand you know how bad is it and all the rest but uh, you know how relevant is this are these protests to what's really going on what you know what do you think well um, yeah there's political motivation there and sorts of terrible but I don't believe the Black Lives Matter movement is concerned about every black life. I don't believe it at all. Because, and it's all based on evidence. Are black people killed in the United States? But it appears to be the black life that's killed by a white cop, and there's a camera there to video it. That's the only life. That's the only life that matters. Um, I listened to a commentator yesterday. His name's just escaped. So the guy, the guy Williams, black guy, wearing a Trump hat. <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah, guy, yeah. Said, um, yeah. He, um, he talked about yeah the shootings in Chicago, one hundred shootings over the weekend, just last weekend, yeah. and of which um, four were youths. Uh, I don't know the full figure of how many died. I thought he said 14 got killed. 100 shootings, maybe 14 killed. Four were used, and one was a three. So, and it's pretty much primarily black on black killing. So, in all of these situations, um, they are they're just being stirred up, you know, by the media, and, but there are other forces at play too because. The political parties are trying to keep um, promote a message. So, and, and, hey, you know the George Floyd thing. There's even some commentators saying, you know, it's Trump's fault. I'm, I don't know, man. They can they can make a story out of nothing, man. They can connect. I don't know how they can connect these dots, but their minds are so warped and twisted that they'll spin anything to in their favour. So. You can pretty much write off the mainstream media unless they're reporting on 
here's a camera and a video shot of a car crash. Okay, they can say a car crash. They can say the sky is blue and the grass is green. But other than that, I wouldn't trust them about anything. You know, gee, hey, they regularly get the weather wrong. So the, the George Floyd thing and and uh, what's happening there, I, I, I see them all connected. It's it's connected to leftist agenda. Um, and if, in my view, leftist agenda is driven by, uh, if we go back in time, um, you know, as far as I can see and what I've read, when secular humanism has been promoted in education, uh, certainly during the after the war, um, that has yeah, yeah trying to heal humanity without God. Personally, it's my personal belief can't be done. Um, so, and if you take any minority group, whether it's LGBT, Black Lives Matter, feminists. Minority or marginalised, or some group that claims victimhood. Um, I think every you know indigenous um, and take the ideals that they want in the modern Western world to its fullest extent, and somebody always misses out. Um, as far as the Black Lives Matter concerned, um, you know they they're, they're making a a martyr. I remember hearing. Black he, what happened to him was terrible. But he's not a hero and he's not a martyr for the black people, is what he's saying. Uh, we've got other people who who are our real martyrs. Um, he, you know, his lifestyle was a bit of a mixed bag. Um, you know, what happened to him was absolutely terrible, and let's just leave it at that. Um, don't don't make anything else of it or of him. The cop who did it, I think, he lost his humanity. Man, he, he was sitting. Had his knee on his neck and his hands in his pockets. He, you can't hide in your badge doing that. So, but good news is all the evidence is there, and they've got him arrested. He's lost his job, and he's going up for murder. So, I don't know where else because when you when you look at the, stati the statistics, don't don't add up. Actually, truly killed by uh, unarmed black people killed by by cops, but. It's not really my place to say. I mean, there's a lot of statistics here. It's just saying, you asked me my perspective. My perspective is this. You would get angry and emotional, and you would say, man, the whole of America is corrupt. The whole of America's police force is corrupt. And, uh, and uh, defund the police. <laughs> and, of course, that's what people have done. But yeah. I've lived long enough, like you have, Colin, and we know. Look at a story and go, it's terrible. But wait, hold your comment. Wait for the stats to come out. And, and everything has to be held in perspective. And the real perspective is a terrible crime. A cop and killing George Floyd. That's it. I'm not, let's not make light of it. It's absolutely terrible. But the, the, Community reaction in relation to that, it's lost its original meaning now. There's so many people, be, there's cops have been killed, there's innocent bystanders have been killed. I seen a video the other day, the Black Lives Matter crew were working, walking past this guy's house and he was going, yeah, good on you, man, I'm with you, I'm with you. Someone picks up a rock and throws it through his window. It's just, it's not protest, it's, it's anarchy now. Yeah, to me, it's and, like an excuse. They've, you know, it's just uh, they yeah. found the excuse and they're running with it. We look at uh, the west coast of the US, Seattle. They've got their autonomous zone and defund the cops. And what happened? Some guy, two guys got shot, one died in there, and then they wouldn't let the uh, emergency services in to try and pull the other guy out. And they eventually got him out, and he's he's critical. And uh, I just. They want to defund the police. These cities, especially in the US, want to defund the police. And where they want to defund the police the most is in these lower, these uh, lower socioeconomic areas of the cities, which of course is the worst place to def not yeah, get yeah. police. You know, I just can't. Um, yeah, no, they're welcome to their anarchy. The kind of stats that I'm looking for. I mean, crime's crime, and they're just 
actually stirred up a whole lot of uh, criminals anyway. So these guys were criminals before um, George Floyd got killed. It just gave them an excuse to get out there and cause havoc and mayhem. But it, as always, it's not so much what the criminals do, what criminals do. Low lives do what low lives do. They always have. But it's the authorities around them and how they deal with it. So if they agree with with this. Now I read an article because uh, where, where did it really happen? Where did it, George get killed? It was in was it Minneapolis or Minnesota or somewhere? Yeah, it was in Minneapolis. Uh, well, Minneapolis. That's it. Well, there's a big um, well-known company that is pulling out. So I like that. I, I want to know what's happening there. You know what that means, eh? Yeah, jobs are Lots going. Jobs. So therefore. Let's have a look at it, and, and we know what to, you know. They all seem to support the Democratic Party, so and all these states where it's happening is in the Democratic areas. So they're going to, uh, if businesses pull out, cops don't want to work there. They're going to invite anarchy. Who wants to live there? And so they're just going to uh, create low lives as well as attract more low lives. And everybody who has vision, hope, scope, uh, even even Democratic people who who Democratic Party want good things for people, they won't be able to stick around there either. They'll, they'll get up and leave as well. So, you know, that's what I mean. If you if you pander to these people, we all have to learn to get on. And, you know, um, Obama said in his last speech, he said, you know, there's never been a better time to be alive. You can do whatever you want to do and be whoever you want to be if you're willing to knuckle down and get focused. Um, and uneducated people, the criminal element, and people who sort of live on the edge and, and even, uh, you know, they've got a limited view of myself. Some might say I'm still there. <laughs> um, we need people with big ideas to help us move forward. And I'm very grateful the courses I've done over the years and the exposure and books I've read, preachers I've listened to, commentators I've listened to that helped expand my mind. And then I've gained new ideas and gone and tried them. I've had to persevere and try and grow your capacity as a person. Well, if these people, uh, if you scare all of these ideas people away from living amongst them, they're not going to grow. And they're just pandering to them. And they like giving them handouts as long as they can get their vote and get their support. They actually don't know how to build a society. They've lost track of it. And and certainly worse is the politicians because they just want the vote so they can stay in power. So they don't genuinely care about what's best for the people. How you know, and they don't actually know how to help and support people. Yeah, that's so, the thing I know, see. But they're so so far out of touch that uh, with you know yeah. reality, what's really happening? You know, I mean, look at our minister of health. The police is, <laughs> yeah, yeah. If they, you know, I mean, people want law and order. We we are in a world now. I mean, even in my street, I know there's Filipinos. Just within five houses of me, we have Filipinos, Samoans. Our, uh, I suppose, yeah, NZ European, uh, Maori, uh, drug dealer over the road. <laughs> I, won't, I won't say what nationality they are, <laughs> but uh, you know, and, and, a, and a dear old um, elderly couple across the road. So, what a great world we have! So, we're going to have to just learn how to get on. You know, the Filipinos are allowed to eat their food, greet their way and speak their language. So are the Samoans that can go to church. I'm allowed to have my hangi in my backyard. And I just have to be a bit considerate on when I light the fire and what kind of wood I use so it doesn't the smoke doesn't go in the neighbor's washing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So learn how to get on, be considerate for each other. Um, we had a party here. Oh, when was the last party? Might have been my son's farewell. We were around told the neighbors, they said, sure, fine. So you just be normal and, and be considerate. So I like that we live in a melting pot. Uh, and I like that every now and then we have a unique focus on a culture. Um, 
you know, if we're going to have a multicultural event or we're going to have a Pacifica event. Um, I've been to an event because we have a lot of Filipino workers that came over after the earthquakes in Christchurch, and I've been to a Filipino event. Love it. Love them all. So, uh, and, and it contributes to me as a person to grow and learn new things and learn new ways. So um, th there's a sad side to our society too on how some people are scared about learning about other cultures. And so, especially our Maori culture, you know, some people say this about, uh, or just to let people know, currently I teach kapahaka, our Maori cultural arts and expressions in school, and I mentor young Maori men who have been in trouble with the law. So I'm very involved with Maori community. Um, I, can, I can speak a bit of our language, and I, I, I uh, yeah, no, I'm very, I'm very, very well connected. I am saddened by some of our New Zealand people, some of our Pākehā New Zealand people who don't want to make an attempt to speak the language properly, who don't want to make any attempt. Uh, never want to go and visit a marae or or uh, learn anything, learn a, learn a proverb, um, anything to do with our culture. And I, I don't understand. Um, yeah, I, I really, I, re I really don't because um, you know we say we're one nation, but the reality is with that mindset, yeah, we can say we're one nation. But as far as cultural expression is concerned, let's be reasonable and do it my way. And that's how that comes across. Nobody's saying it out loud, mm. but that's how it comes across. Do you think, I think sometimes too, people are probably a bit fearful or they're nervous uh, when it comes to, you know, reparations, the treaty, all that sort of stuff. People sort of switch off, a, they sort of attach the two permanently together, you know. And, and uh, I think I said a couple of weeks ago, you know, Freaking where New Zealand was so lucky. We've got this fantastic, beautiful culture. Um, we're such a unique country, I think. Anyway, well, we've got a chance to be very unique, you know. And the fact is, uh, New Zealand was colonised by Europeans, and we can't undo that now. But what we can do is freaking, like you say, learn to get along. The, you know, imagine if New Zealand was just two empty islands when the Brits got here. You know, just. What would it be? It would just be a little England, fish and chips and cricket, and that'd be about it, you know? Yeah. It's, <laughs> you know? So I, I don't um, think people should be fearful, at, at, you know, the yeah. taxpayers yeah. paying paying reparations or whatever, and it's probably not the right, what, right word, reparations, and but... Um, it's my belief, yeah, it's my belief that if a crime was committed and you have evidence, then take it to a court of law. And, uh, okay, so 200 years ago, the whole of New Zealand Aotearoa belonged to Māori. Today, I think it's about 15%. So what happened? Was it all acquired honestly? <laughs> so, you know, the thing about it is you can't have one conversation about this and there's no one easy to look at a system called the Waitangi Tribunal um, and that's uh, are being fixed. I don't agree with every Māori claim that goes in and I don't agree with every um, counter argument that we, you know, that shouldn't be paid. Uh, yeah, interesting, interesting thought here. I'll, I'll, I'll put this out to you. Um, I gave a talk into a, in a school I think they were, yeah, they were senior school, so year 11, 12, 13, what's that, in New Zealand, so that's sort of like 15 to 18-year-olds, uh, and they wanted me to talk about current events in New Zealand at the time. I think it might have been a bit earlier, 2015, 2014. I talked about when in New Zealand in 2008 all of those finance companies started going under. Yeah, I remember. You, um, and there was the South Canterbury Finance, that went under for $1.5 billion. And there were so many companies went under. I think there were 20-plus finance companies went under. And 
I only added up the top eight, well, the eight that had, had the biggest sum that they lost financially, and the New Zealand government bailed them out, every single one of them. Uh, and at that time, I think it was, I added it up, it was 6.5 billion worth of bailout. Now, the New Zealand public certainly weren't very happy about it, but they just had to suck it up and accept it because it would have affected whole communities, banks, um, it would have affected mortgages, everything. Oh, so much would have gone under. So they said the government had to bail them out. So $6.5 billion, And there was a bit of people were upset at the time. Okay. However, at that same time that I had gave, given that talk, the government to date had only paid out one billion in treaty settlements. But yet the resistance against treaty settlements uh, just, um, you know, it was disproportionate. It was just, and decades of it. Yeah, now I yeah. put a lot of that on the media. So one billion were the treaty settlements, no way, too much, what do they want now, all that sort of thing. 6.5 billion bailing out these billionaires and millionaires. Um, so you can see, you can see what I mean. It just depends. Um, yeah, if there's a crime committed, any crime, then take it to a court of law. And if you've got evidence, then you should pursue uh, a reparation. And that's what's happened. What I like from the treaty settlements is there's a couple of tribes that have. Set a shining example, well, certainly Ngaitahu down here. I think they've nearly turned their assets. They got given 170 million back in the mid 90s, and so did Tainui up in the up in the north there. Uh, they've turned their 170 million almost into two billion, and, and Tainui would be the same. So, you know, if you can build an economic base, and then you can help your people. Um, but it's complex and complicated, and there's no one answer. Our New Zealand system is miles ahead. I have no idea what they would do in the United States because they don't recognise uh, tribally. Um, you know, there is another group of people. Okay, so we're talking about the black situation there. But what about the indigenous American Indian? Um, I know some, uh, I've met a few, and, you know, they've told me some of these stories that. The drug and alcohol addiction and, and uh, domestic violence and abuse and things like that within their families. So there's a lot of help needed. Um, you know, we're here to help people. We, we're here to help and support and understand everyone. It's just how we do it. And I just do not believe in much of the liberal ideology at all. There's only one thing I believe in the liberal ideology, and that is really good ideas. Let's be liberal with those. <laughs> they don't have any good ideas. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I'll have to keep that one. That's a, that's a good one. I'm going to take that one on myself. Yeah. Yeah. It's about right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think they can't see the forest for the trees. I just, I don't know. To me, most of them, it's all about them feeling good. You know, it's, it can be quite condescending, you know, what they try and do, you know, all the virtue signaling and, and uh, are they really helping? No. I don't think so. You got a, you know, a hand, yeah. a hand up, not a hand out, and you know we hear that a lot. But it's true, you know. Um, if you if you're down, there's only one way to go, and that's up. And you got to, and don't expect other people to do it for you. You've got to be motivated and, and and pick yourself up. And like Jordan Peterson says, get out of bed in the morning and make your bed and attack the day. You know. Um, right. there's, there's no point sitting there on the couch waiting for somebody to knock on the door and say, here, have this great job, you know. You've got to go out yeah. and, and and it's your life. You've got to make it, you know, as best you can, you know. So I just... And that's... Yeah. Sorry, mate. Yeah. That's um, what I think is the greatest gift that we have is the individual ability to make decisions. I've got a fantastic story right next door. My neighbor's boy leaves high school. Um, not the brightest kid, he admitted that himself, but a low paying job. Um, went and worked on a fishing boat and just filleting fish and doing whatever. Then he managed to get double shift, so he just saved, saved, saved. 18 months later, as a 19 year old, buys a house. 
So while all of his other mates, um, you know, booze the booze up their money and having fun, having a larrikin time, then you know what? I'm not, I'm not going to jump all over his mates and everything else. I, my issue is this kid got got to focus and pulled off his goal. So you can do it. Yeah, thanks for that, Steve. The uh, another thing I want to talk about was uh, it's a subject that stared in my heart and it, it tears me up every time I read anything about it. And, and we've got a pretty bad record in New Zealand track record, I suppose. Any record is bad, but uh, you know domestic abuse and child abuse in New Zealand. It's freaking shocking. Um, you know, we can all break the quarantine and go walk down Queen Street about, uh, you know, poor old George again over in uh, the States. But it makes me wonder if you if you uh, tried to organise a pro-life protest down the main street or or, or, um, or something to do with, uh, you know, protesting the new gun laws, that the draconian gun laws that they bought out. You know, they wouldn't stand for it. It wouldn't be tolerated. You know, I think it was a... A little fringe uh, pet subject, I guess, if, if you will, of our, or our glorious leader. But um, yeah, the domestic, uh, you know, violence in New Zealand, child abuse. You know, what's what's going on there? And I mean, not easy. But how can we, you know, how can we fix that? Well, having worked many years with these families. Um, and having had to learn a lot of things that I should have learned when I was a kid as an adult, which can be embarrassing, sort of like reparenting yourself. <laughs> um, I think we could deal to, you know, eliminate 50, 60, 70% of the problem um, if it, you know, just dealing with basic parenting and basic, uh, it, it, it's a complex thing, but there are some things that we that don't help. Okay, the, the sex education message in New Zealand basically is have sex with whoever you want as long as you don't catch an STD. Uh, they do talk a bit about unwanted pregnancy, um, and they ain't talking to your teenagers about it, but I'm seeing people in their 20s and 30s uh, who evidently getting abortion. So people are, number one, irresponsible when they have sex um, because there's a whole lot of unwanted pregnancy. Do you know, actually I, I heard the statistic the other day, if you see a pregnant woman in New York, a pregnant black woman, there's a higher probability uh, of over 50% of pregnant black women in New York are going to abort. Man, that's, that's pretty brutal in itself. But why get pregnant in the first place? You can have you can have sex if you want to have sex uh, without getting pregnant. All right. Um, okay. There's a value system and there's a value system that I'm off. I understand that everyone's not off that value system. But if you want to go out and have sex, look, you can do it without getting pregnant. So, firstly, let's put the blame because you know, a lot of people bang on about abortion uh, right where it needs to go. People are irresponsible. They haven't grown up. It's like dealing with guns, mate. Your sex organs are the same. They're dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know it. I suppose I, I know what you're saying. Yeah. So there's number one. There's number one. All right. Number two. Now that you're pregnant, or you know your partner's going to have a baby, or she's no longer your partner but she's pregnant to you, you can decide to do some growing up and um, that's a big failure there because people choose not to so many so learn some skills how can I be a better how can I even be a mum how can I be a dad um, but everything's put in nice suggestions uh, in the nice suggestion box there's, uh, there's some plenty of good organisations that can help you and educate um, thirdly, people aren't spiritually and emotionally ready for the pressure of having a child. 
So you can see it's starting to pile up, eh? Yeah, I can see that. See, no life skills, don't know how to look after a child. Uh, and I'm not talking about feed, clothe, nappy. I mean, like, read the kid a book, give them the same routine when you tuck them in a bed at night. Um, you know, stimulate their mind, take them to the park and play with them, those sort of things. So you can see it starting to stack up. All these things are preventable, but we have such a permissive society that we won't deal with it. We only make nice suggestions. Well, they're just ignoring your nice suggestions because you're still giving money, which empowers. Uh, we're giving the wrong messages to our young people. So irresponsible sex got pregnant, no life skills to have a raise a child, no emotional and spiritual intelligence to deal with the pressure, um, still wanting to be a lad or wanting to be one of the girls and go out on the booze and have a good time and still full of selfishness. So baby kids get in the way. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Myself, I think of myself, uh, you know, it wasn't till in my 30s, probably mid-30s before I, I recognized in myself that, okay, I was probably really have some kids, you know. I yeah. Right through my 20s. And it, you're right, it's, it, I wasn't mature. It certainly wouldn't have been mature enough. And, and uh, who knows whether it would have run a mile or not, I don't know. But um, being mature, and like you say, you've got to give up some stuff. And, and I talked to friends who had kids, and I was adamant, no, nah, no kids, no kids. And that was purely selfish reasons because I didn't want to change my lifestyle. I had wanted to do what I wanted to do. And uh, and somebody told me, they said, look, it's true, Colin, you know, when you have kids, everything changes and you've got to give up all the stuff. But you know what? You don't care. It doesn't matter because you've got this, you got this beautiful life, this gift that's been given to us, and uh, it doesn't matter anymore. And it did right. My life, I from the moment uh, my first child was born, my life changed completely. And uh, it's true. I did give up a lot of stuff, but I was glad to do it, and it, I didn't miss it. I had this mm. something much, much, yeah, good on you. much That's more great. fantastic, you know, than oh, any really any fantastic. material thing, you know. Absolutely. And uh, you know, yeah. most parents, but, so, and this is why I can't understand it. I struggle because, yeah. uh, you know, and I know a lot of parents, and and most parents, the majority of parents would do anything for their kids. You know, it's the biggest thing that's happened in their lives. It's this precious gift we've got, and it's very hard to get your head around uh, what's happening to some of these kids in their in their own homes. You know. Yeah. So, you, so there you go again, we're dealing with a values clash. So, you know, when you and I were young, so, you know, when you're in the army, but we're 16, man, far out, still young, it's just kids. But our values were do our job, but when we weren't doing our soldiering, it was all about us. And, and society's message has been pretty consistent for quite a few decades now. Now we're reaping the results of it. And that is, you know, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? You know, all, all about you. You It's putting you at the center of your equation. See, I raised my kids to say that you, you're important, but you're an important part of this community, whether it's your church community, whether it's your wider family, Maori community. If we joined a sports team, the team was important. You know, I taught them the value of you got two weeks to make up your mind if you're going to be a part of this team. At two weeks, I'm going to ask you again, you want to be in? And they say, yes. I said, right, that's it. Every practice, every game, even in the middle of the winter when it's freezing cold and you don't want to get out of bed, you're going. And, you know, those, those are building blocks. Those are values. Uh, and and um, so all of these little building blocks, these things I'm talking about, this is why suicide rate's high. The... Um, Child abuse is there because we've got selfish, uh, frustrated, angry um, people who are, have got kids that they didn't plan for. They say they love them, but they don't because I've seen it. I, I, you, you, if you love your kid, you don't send them to school without shoes and food and, and the basic necessities. You go without so they can have. Um, I'm sorry, and, and, and if you don't, and you don't know how, see, we, we, we've, I'll just get into this subject. 
desperation I was talking about before. Desperation should be a value. When people get desperate, they start going, right, what can I do? Okay, find an extra job. I'm going to push through. I'm going to make a way somehow. I'm going to find the way. I, when we've been desperate for a moment, go and get to do anything. And it's, but we made sure it was only for a season. And anything to get through this season to get my kids to work where they need to go. So we've basically got a selfish society that doesn't care. So now we're starting to talk about culture because a culture is when you've got certain practices and you do them over and over again, even if you don't like them, you've developed a culture. Some men have got a culture of watching pornography. Some uh, people have got a culture of being angry and being frustrated all the time, you know? Some people have got a culture, you know, like I know people uh, always like, that's their culture. Mm -hmm. Always, you know, uh, some, some, there's, there's lots of reasons why, but that's, that's what building the culture is. You, you hear about sports teams, and I listen to sometimes, like, if we get a new, you know, we're here in Christchurch, we've got the Crusaders, and a new guy comes into the team, and they say this, and they say things like, oh, I love it, I love the culture here. Yeah, it doesn't have to be the Crusaders. Right. And what they mean is, uh, they're on time, when they train, they train hard, they're efficient. See, none of these things I'm talking about now cost money. None of these things, are, and, and yet they are the, the skills and the drills that wealthy people do. But, but I'll say it, poor people don't want to listen, can't get focused. Uh, you know, something has to convince them. And that's what I like about coming to, it's a, it, it blows your mind. It's like, whoa, you know, God is real. And uh, he is powerful and he touched my heart and he touched my mind. And man, has he got me it's my attention. So what does he want me to do? And then you read, you, you know, you start going through the through the scriptures and, and it starts teaching you the basic things in life. And then you're reading the Ten Commandments and you, you're following the lifestyle of Jesus and it just teaches you to do all those small things well. Man. So faith, faith is a good thing. Um, one thing I'll tell you about modern society, there is a bunch of uh, professors who, they're, they're atheists and agnostic and everything else, and they're saying, because they've tried to, you know, everyone's trying to get rid of faith, but they're saying, hold on a minute, as well as our good friend, the Dr. Jordan Peterson, there just might be something in this Christian. There just might be something in these values, because they're looking, and you observe the people who live that lifestyle and they the world is crazy around them but they themselves have managed to create some peace a good lifestyle good well-being for them and their families and they have quite a good outlook on the world and uh yeah so i, I think you'll find the stats that is sort of in favor favor of that yeah that's interesting uh because you're talking about uh, being poor, the difference between poor people and rich people. And, and uh, I spent a lot of time in Latin America, a lot of time. And it's, it's interesting over there because the government won't help you. So, you know, we're talking about enabling people to uh, just stay where they are. And how do we enable people to stay where they are? Just throw money at them, you know. And uh, human nature is to take the path of least resistance. And, and people, so when, they, when they're down at the level in the government... Uh, basically gives them their money, they they adjust to that lifestyle. Well in Latin America there's no there's no help. It's your family or nothing. And uh you can see these shanty towns with no running yeah. water and open sewage and people oh, yeah. living in these the tar paper houses and those kids go leave that tar paper shack every morning with their hair groomed, their school uniforms ironed yeah. awesome. and off they go every day. And yeah. uh, the schools are packed, night schools. Yeah. You try and uh, get on people in New Zealand, I think they think, well, I work my 40 hours, I work my one job, and I can't, it's not enough to live. Well, I can tell you in Latin America and other places around the world, there's people working three jobs to get their kids educated so they don't have to live like that. Because now, yeah. So they're getting off their, off their backside oh, and doing it. But we're enabling them to yeah. stay down there. This is the problem. People... Yeah. 
You know, they get comfortable and think, oh, well, this is okay. But then they get resentful of people that have worked hard, pick yeah. themselves up and they're doing well. But I don't know too many wealthy people that sleep in every day. No. You know? <laughs> they made their wealth. That's how they, what they to live. But yes. Yeah, but they probably some... you probably died of a heart attack in the in the early sixty because they've worked so hard. But I um, I deal with a lot of them with, uh, through my own work, and I uh, tell you what, those those business owners and those they're uh, moving the they're sleeping four or five hours a night. That's it. And uh, yes. so anybody that says they don't work, boy, they are working. Yeah, they are. And you know they're working because they know they're either they still want to make money, or sometimes you know uh, they might be in a bit of trouble. But even those who don't uh, need the money, they like to be productive. And that, the, the, the wealth is the habits in your life that make you feel good. The result of your work, you can see that's good fruit of that. And then you can see even better how it blesses others. I never forget the story I heard. And it was about a guy who had four sons and uh, you know he, he ran a, he was a wealthy farmer and um, his sons all played sport on Saturday they did school during the week and then they played in the sport in the afternoon but every Saturday morning they'd get up and they had chores to do he said to him hey mate why why do you work your boys so hard every week haven't you made enough money and he was already a wealthy farmer he said I'm not making money, I'm making me. And I'm, I've never forgotten that teaching these young boys there's value in work. He could have thrown any money at these guys, they school all week, and they need to rest on the weekend before the game. But he said, no, you're going to do some chores around the farm. And, and, uh, and he, you know, they put four hours or something on a Saturday morning. And that won't hurt them. They will teach them a good work ethic. And teach them to value things, you know, value tools, um, value the boss, um, yeah, the value of work. The key thing is, it's sad if you work just for money. That's the saddest thing. You should work because you enjoy your work and you enjoy the fruit of what you make. Uh, whoever receives the product of what you do, you can see the fruit of that. And enjoy your workmates around you. So there's just like, yeah, see, that's another thing is maturing. A lot of people, there, and I, even at our age, there's a lot of guys that are not, they're not very mature. They've got to, you know, grow and expand. And, and I love work. I love going to work on Monday. I look forward to it. Really, really do. Because, you know, your structure just lays me out on the weekend. Or, oh, I'm very productive on my weekends. But, but yeah. I like to, you know, just get into that structure and serving other people. And, you know, sadly, if you go back to the social service side of things. So now we've, we've created a whole social service industry. And I've met a lot of those people in there. And, you know, partly it's what I work in. And they're, by nature, they're just rescuers. And they've created this rescuing industry. And uh, they're trying to help people, whereas I believe it's a God-ordained place for someone sometimes, for everyone, to be in desperation. So then you cry out to him and you get resourceful and you learn to make, I don't know, invent a way, just get it done. I heard that from um, Sergeant Tipeny when I was on CB in, uh, over in Singapore. <laughs> when, hey, 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 it was uh, Nick Barber. Yeah. He, he says, Sergeant Tipeny says to us, we're on CB. All right, I want you to all double away and come back with a yard broom each. And old, and old Nick, remember how he used to talk back then? He goes, but Sarge, there's uh, four of us here from our company, and I know there's only three yard brooms in our in our barracks. And he went, I don't care. Find a way, make a way, invent a way. you got two minutes to get back here with a broom. Sure enough, Nick came back with a broom. So, you know, and that kind of, you know, we understand that from our well, money <laughs> they can find them to barracks and CP and stuff. And, uh, but we understand when we are being desperate. And I actually think that's really good for us because it makes us, it cuts out the rubbish you know, the rubbish thoughts, the distractions in our life, and it's like, jeez, man, I am friggin' desperate. I need some answers. So it's going to force you to your knees and, and in prayer. That's what I like. Man. And you to think 
and it's going to force you to look left and right, and it's going to maybe I need to go and talk to someone. See, that's part of your answer. Go find a solution. And um, we've got a whole group of people who, when they get to that point, voila, the local social service will turn up and hand it to you on a plate. So you know what's going to happen, eh? That will get them by for a month, a week, or whatever, a year. And then next year, they're back in the same place mm-hmm. because they haven't learned their life lesson. And, yeah, we've got to stop this over-promising uh, because we're over-promising and under-delivering. And I'm finding, you know, in the circles I'm moving, so social services do it. The government, they're shockers. They just pack us straight out of lives. Um, I see the government's promise tonight. What was that? The, the rail from the airport to the city <laughs> ain't going to happen now. See, promise. That was election promise. Surprise, surprise, you know. You know, you know so they just do it all the time. Uh, churches over promise. Everyone over promises. I think we that's half the problem. We need to be telling people life is friggin' brutal and tough. And you need to be careful, because if you're not careful, you don't think yourself through situations. You could hurt, get hurt, and die. There's nothing wrong with that equation. Then you go, but it's brutal and tough. If you learn some wisdom, learn from the right people, observe, and then work your ass off, you might. Well, and in some cases, there's a good chance you could carve out a good living for yourself to the point that you could actually be all right for yourself and help a few others. So I just think we need to tone back the promises and just say, mate, the expectation's on you. Bah, that's yeah. it. That's it. Everybody expects too much. They expect, like I said before, they're expecting somebody to knock on the door and say, hey, take this 100K job, you know. Yeah, it's, uh... yeah it just doesn't happen. And, you know, last thing, oh, you know, as, as I wind up anyway, last thing I think, I think that Christianity gave us and tribal thinking and tribal identity politics doesn't. They don't care about the individual. And the greatest thing that we have now, Colin, is see, you don't have to consult your tribal leader about what job you want, what car you want to buy, what jo- um, uh, who you want to marry. Uh, we want to live. We have the sovereign, gifted right to our own personal freedoms, and that's what you see the Americans go on about. So they they know the value of that. And I don't want to sell those freedoms down down the line to some socialist communist party or government. But the ability to think for myself, come up with solutions, get with other people and work together, and create a good life that's good for us and hopefully can inspire others. That gift to be able to think for yourself, I believe that was a gift that Christianity gave us. Yeah, well, that's right. We don't want to uh, never give up, especially at, at the moment. Uh, yeah. You know, it's getting handed to them on a plate at the moment. So the more people that can uh, we can talk to and get them to think for themselves, a better chance for God of uh, improving things. But uh, I don't. Yeah. Uh, can't think of any socialist success story in the world ever. No. There is, I don't. You couldn't name one, could you? And uh, no. it's amazing the amount of people that just want to walk down that road. They want to take that road, and uh, and thinking it's all going to be, you know, all beer and skittles. But it's only beer and yeah. skittles if you make your own beer and skittles. See, I would like to just add a bit of what I think is the kiwi flavour to this conversation. Because I don't even want to use those terms, but we need some, like, say, for example, um, paying for our roads is a type of socialism. Um, it's the full blown socialism and control. You know, we've got to pay tax because we need some health care, we need some, uh, you know, we need roads. Uh, we need some welfare, we need education. So all of that is everybody contributing towards that. So I don't mind that. What I also like is we also need a tension between um, free thinking, free enterprise, free opportunity, 
and that money into education, money into health, money into roads. We need both, but um, and also the tension between those two, I think, is healthy. So I I just no, I'm just noticing that the social side now in today's world is starting to close down that free thinking, free enterprise. Those people who have those ideas, that's where the yeah. danger is. So I'm not like, oh, all, all socialism is bad. It's just, I suppose it's a label. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with welfare and caring for people. Mate, you might be a hard worker, you know, busting your ass on the job. You have a genuine accident on the job, mate. I want to know that we've got an accident compensation um, government organisation that can support you through your injury to get you back to work financially and everything. You know, there's nothing wrong with that, eh? Yeah, that's so, true. So it's, sometimes we have to watch out with the words and the argument, and I, I just believe we need to, and I would say, Colin, that this is our Kiwi fire, you know, put our Kiwi approach on it, because I know the American approach is real hard line either way. It just seems to be one or the other, and I don't, yeah, and they're getting further and further oh, apart as well. That's for sure. Yeah, no, they're getting very that's polarized. What they're, doing there. Yeah. they're dividing themselves so far apart. Whereas I, I want us to work together, and I just want the best ideas to come out, and I want there always to be, well, that'll happen anyway. I observe where there's healthy ideas, and we eventually get to a good solution. There's always a bit of tension, and that tension is like the sifting out. Sifting out the rubbish part of the idea it might be a genuinely good idea, but it just needs to be sifted a bit. So this is this is the area I sit in. I like to talk policy. I like to attack the areas where bad ideas come from, primarily the humanities department in the universities. Um, but we won't we won't open up that one. Um, but that's primarily sold itself out to left leftist ideology. And uh, so let's have a look at how we can best move forward. Uh, we, we, are in, we are in tricky times. Um, I also believe in the prophecies of the Bible, so that's, and I believe in a prophetic timeline, so that's, I believe that's sort of affecting us as well. Um, so anyway, these are my humble views and opinions. Uh, if they ca didn't come across humbly, I, I apologise, <laughs> but hopefully... Uh, Hopefully, you know, people get to hear the heart. And, uh, you know, I'm just a bloke working away in Christchurch here and wanting the best for my community, my family. Uh, I've got some ideas like what you're doing yourself there, Colin. You know, as I said at the start, I salute you for what you're doing. Um, creating a platform, it'll pick up momentum. And uh, it, well, it already has got momentum. And letting the world know that there are other people with their views out there and because we really do need to have a more steady head, some wiser words. Um, <clears throat> that's, um, yeah. I want to say that I do love millennials. One of my, you know, one of my kids is a millennial and the other two are Gen Z. So I love, I love this generation. Um, and, uh, of course, they grew up under their father's wisdom, not the wisdom of the world. And what's out there so uh, but they're their own people um, and, and I, I love them dearly we, we get on a good relationship we've never really had a long falling out like a lot of parents do with their teenage years you know reflecting back uh, Colin you know when we're talking about having kids you know I've started to reconnect with some of the boys from the old army days and some of them said well where you been I said Having a family and raising kids, that's what you do, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. But all my kids are my friends. They're adult, adults themselves. We get on great. We still fight like cats and dogs, but they know the love's there. We're relationally good. We can disagree, and then um, there's never, never really any major issues with us. So if you put the time in in the young years, your kids can be your friends, your best friends as you grow up. And they just bring a lot of joy to my heart. And I often think about them every day. Text them often, tell them I love them. And, uh, you know, it just makes my life, I feel so blessed and honoured and rewarded. Nice. Their mother and I were very intentional about some of the values we put in them. 
and because of that, it's paid off. Yeah, it's great, Steve. Eh? It's good to hear. That's for sure. And uh, just want to thank you, Steve, for giving us your time. And uh, I've got a few things to edit up on that. Probably I need to yeah, trim, right. it, it's, trim, it's trim it down, a, a, little, down. <laughs> a little bit. But uh, thanks very much for coming on and sharing some of your wisdom and some of your life experience. Um, yeah, I really enjoy your, uh, your little videos you put up on the Facebook when you're cruising around town. And I can tell oh, you've yeah. been thinking about it for a while and you decide, oh, well, stuff it. I'm going to hit the record button and, and, and get it out. And uh, uh, I know when I see one of your videos like that come up on my feed, I, I pay attention and have a good listen. So thanks very much for coming on, Steve. And, uh, yeah, catch up with you uh, soon. Up your yeah, way. Mate, we will. We've got to plan a fishing trip. Is it Labor Weekend? We've got fishing and hunting or something. Labor Weekend. That's going to be our boys' weekend. We'll make it happen, bro. Yeah. yeah. No, that's awesome, mate. Bro, Tom, all this, mate. Cheers, brother. Cheers, mate. <laughs>